Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, October 26th, 2022. It's great to be back with Professor Zach Ross. Zach, once again, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for talking to me. Zach, today what we're going to do is go all the way back, learn about your family background, your early interest in science after our first conversation where we took a really interesting tour about your research and all of the things that are interesting to you in geophysics and seismology. Let's start first with your, your family. Do you come from a scientific family? Does that run back in your family? Um, not really. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely the only one in even my extended family that does anything related to science. So, um, Where are your parents from? They're from L.A. And you grew yeah. up in L.A.? I, just outside, yeah. What, what do your parents do for a living? Um, my mom uh, was a speech pathologist, um, and my dad uh, worked for um, the, um, well, he, he, most of his career he worked at NBC, um, and so he, he worked in, um, in, like, videotape stuff. Yeah, so, um, yeah, very far removed from... <laughs> anything I do or think about uh, on a daily basis. Zach, what, what about just growing up in Southern California? Did earthquakes sort of register with you? Were you interested in them when you were a kid? Um, not specifically, no. Um, um, I, I became very interested in science from a, in, I'd say probably around middle school or so. Um, and I mean, I, I remember even earlier going to um, like summer camps and stuff that were science themed and, and learning about, you know, how things work in, in the world and stuff like that. Um, and I always really enjoyed that. Um, I think for me, uh, it my interest in science really picked up when I got into high school um, and particularly I became interested in, in physics and um, so, but the earthquake side of it was not really um, there for me at that time. I, I mean, I, you know, I lived through the Northridge earthquake and all that stuff. So um, it was, something I, I thought about, but not um, something that I was kind of scientifically curious about, at, at least at, at those in, in those years. Zach, you went to public schools growing up? I did, yeah. Was it a strong curriculum in high school in math and science? Uh, yeah, I would say so. And you said physics. Did you like more the, the theory or the, the experimental side? Um. Well, I mean, it was, I wouldn't even necessarily try to break it into those, those groups as much as it was, um, I just enjoyed, um, learning about how things, um, are and, and work and, and, um, you know, as a, it, at high school level, you're not thinking about theory versus, Sure. Experimental. I mean, it's, um, you know, you're talking about stuff that was done and solved hundreds of years ago. Right. And, and so, um, I, I always really enjoyed those aspects and also the, um, I guess what we're, some of what we're doing right now, which is the, the historical aspects, a lot of, of a lot of that and how, um, I read a lot of biographies early on about, um, scientists like Newton and, and so forth. And, and I always really um, enjoyed learning about the, you know, the person behind all of that stuff and how they got to where they were and, and what put them in the context of being able to do the things that they did and, and so forth. That's, that's what I do. I just went the history route. <laughs> right. Right. Zach, at UC Davis, did you did you focus on physics? Was that the game yeah. plan for you? It was, yeah. What kind of physics? Maybe as you were starting to think more about 
theory and yeah. observation and experiment? It, it was just general, um, general physics, I would say, um, um, at least as far as the, the curriculum goes, but I was more, um, I, at that time I was mostly drawn to, um, kind of optics and wave physics and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I kind of always had an interest in wave physics, but, um, I, I just wasn't quite sure exactly what the, the right, um, path was at, at that point. Zach, what about on the computational side? Were you always good with computers when you were a kid? Was that something that was yeah. interesting to you? Yeah. I mean, I've got, my, my parents have photos of me on a, on a, you know, an old <laughs> PC back in the eighties was on, when I was probably three or four years old working on right, running programs on, you know, DOS computers and things like that. Uh -huh. And, uh, um, I, taught myself how to program from a fairly early age and um, that whole kind of mindset more or less stayed with me, but not uh, in any uh, obvious way until, um, until I got to college, uh, you know, cause more, I was just more tinkering around with stuff and, and learning how it, it what, what you can do and not, you know, it's, it's different when you're, when you're all of a sudden given specific tasks and, and need to solve a real problem of some kind, then it, it, it takes a very different uh, perspective. Zach, I'm curious if it was in undergraduate that you started to think about the value of bringing a computational perspective to physics. Um, probably not. I think that started to really emerge my, my view of all this started to emerge in um when i was working on my phd mm -hmm. um that wasn't until yeah some years after that and did you have any exposure as an undergrad to seismology or geophysics um essentially no um I, towards the end of my, my undergrad years, I kind of was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, and I didn't really want to stay in, um, that traditional physics track for grad school. Um, It, it, I think it was just a bit too esoteric for me. Like string theory and those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. I mean, a lot of the modern research topics, right. As opposed to what you're learning about in undergrad curriculum versus what you're actually doing research on the research side of it today is very, um, felt quite distant, um, for me. Um, and so I was considering trying to basically move instead towards um, an engineering um, direction. Um, and there was, I, 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 this must have been my senior year of undergrad, but I had seen a poster on uh, on the wall in the hallway of um, basically something related to simulations of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake oh. um, and the effect on um, basically hazard and buildings and so forth in, um, in San Francisco. It was kind of like trying to reconstruct some of what happened there. Who, what was the uh, home institution for this project? Was it UC Davis? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that that was pretty interesting. Um, and so I started to just read about stuff in this area and decided that I was going to go um, 
into the earthquake engineering uh, direction. Uh, and so I applied for uh, this master's program in, in civil engineering, specifically in, in like earthquake engineering, um, really with the full intent of, of becoming a, a card carrying engineer. Um, and so I did that. Um, I ended up going to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. Um, and that ended up being a good choice for me because it was, um, it, it was a totally different field. <laughs> I had to learn a lot of stuff, you know, I mean. And this was an MS in engineering? It was, yeah. And so a substantial amount of the coursework that I really needed to have um, going in there, uh, I didn't have. I, I kind of just assumed that a lot of it was. Um, just recycled like, physics kind of thing? And it, and it really was not. It was it, quite a bit different. Um, so I had a lot of room there and flexibility to kind of work my way through that, that program. And, and I was able to kind of cover a lot of that material on my own. Um, they, they were, they were pretty, they had a lot of flexibility there in terms of the way that their program was structured. And so it actually worked out pretty well for me. Um, I think if I had just been dropped right into a, uh, a program somewhere else that was more structured and, and focused, it would have been uh, quite a bit different. <laughs> and was the focus of this program really applied? This was for training future engineers? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it would have been that you would really just, um, it's not, it wasn't meant for research purposes. It was really meant to um, get you ready to file for, take the test for an engineering license and and, uh, and and go off into that world. Now, did you retain whatever wisp of an interest you had in seismology from that poster you saw? Were you aware well, of people like Tom Heaton and the field of, you know, engineering from a seismological background? Yeah, so um, the, the basically the, the program that I was in... Um, it was really quite flexible and it focused largely on geotechnical earthquake engineering. Um, and so I was doing a lot of stuff in particular, my master's thesis was kind of right at the, the interface between seismology and engineering. It's so a really engineering seismology. Um, and so I started to become very familiar with all this stuff at that point. Um, but when I, in the middle of all this, really even quite early on, not even in the middle, but um, I realized that I, I had no interest in actually being a, um, a card-carrying engineer. Um, <laughs> Time to start thinking it, about PhD programs. Yeah, I mean, it, once I, I started to actually learn about seismology and I realized that it was just... Um, you know, wave physics in a different flavor from a lot of the stuff that I was learning about as an undergrad, um, but except it's learning about wave propagation in the earth and um, and that there was kind of a rigorous quantitative uh, description for all of these, these processes and that kind of thing. Um, that That's when it kind of just all clicked for me and... Um, that it wasn't just talking about earthquakes, but it's actually talking about all the math that describes the, the phenomena. And um, and then I also just really valued the kind of the real world implications for hazard and, and what all that meant. So, um, so I decided fairly early on during that master's degree to basically shift a bit and take coursework that was specifically going to 
help me in a in a research capacity moving forward. Um, and so really that was, it, it was quite good for me because of the flexibility that it had in terms of what I could take and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, immediately I, I began to think about uh, kind of reorienting in, in a geophysics context uh, for a PhD program after that. Zach, while we're in the narrative, just a sort of reflective question. Has the engineering degree, that perspective, has that been a value to you? Is that an asset in your research? Um, in some ways, yes. Uh, it, it helps me to think about um, the way that that community thinks about hazard and, and what they need and and so forth it's a very different perspective on on the whole problem um you know they don't really care about how any of it works they only care about you know what they can input to their big um kind of hazard analysis codes and um uh, so it's, it has been helpful, um, more so relatively recently, I would say, than uh, over the previous, you know, decade, uh, because I've, I started to do some work more recently that, that kind of dives back into that direction and, and is on the, the engineering seismology side of things. So, um, so I am relying on it a bit more now than, than before. Once you settled on seismology and geophysics for the PhD, what programs were you looking at? Um, sorry, there was a shadow that was coming in. Um, so I was looking at um, actually programs that were more focused on engineering seismology, which at the time, I didn't really quite realize, but there was actually very few of those left in in the U.S. at that point. Um, for various reasons, that field itself has kind of even disappeared. Um, the two sides of, of this problem, the, the engineering aspects and the scientific aspects, have kind of diverged um, for a number of reasons. And there are very few people that run active research programs in the U S that are kind of right in the middle of those anymore. Um, historically that was not the case. There was always kind of a lot of people working right at the, um, and the intersection between those two. And now it's, um, it, it's basically become two completely different communities. Um, so, but at the time I was looking for more specific, programs that that actually had people working in this area and um that led me to a handful of people that were basically close to retirement age mm -hmm. and because this uh, was considered sort of an older field well it, it I, I mean it's not older it's just um kind of who studies this has changed. So there are very few people within geophysics programs that, that tend to study engineering seismology anymore. Um, whereas, I mean, you maybe you could say that, you know, earthquake early warning is a modern form of this, which didn't exist really even, you know, a handful of years ago. That's that's one way of of thinking about it, but um, there used to be a whole community of people that were basically trained as seismologists um, that were, you know, their research was focused on specifically modeling of the ground motions that um, that 
could be used with by the engineers to do the um, their various types of analyses. That's really not the case anymore. The engineers have kind of themselves taken control of all of the stuff related to ground motion modeling. What accounts for this? Why the shift? Um, well, I wouldn't describe it as a shift as much as a trend. Uh -huh. It's kind of moving in that direction. Um, the, why? I, I think there's been a number of reasons. Um, one is that the engineering community went in a direction that was heavily on the, the probabilistic side of modeling all this stuff and and one that is heavily based on empirical analyses rather than um, physical analyses. Um, so they basically are just doing statistics on on earthquake ground motion records um, and they've moved in a direction that kind of doesn't really care about the process by which those are generated at all. Um, and for a long time, the physics was not, it, the physics itself was not far enough along that it could, um, the models could produce ground motions sufficiently reliable that the engineers would trust them for many, many years, the ground motions predicted by the physical models were substantially larger than anything that had ever been observed before. And the engineers would basically look at these, these simulations and say that those numbers are crazy. You know, we can't actually design buildings with this kind of stuff. And so it, I think the, so these are the kinds of factors that ultimately led to um, these two groups kind of starting to diverge and um it, it became a lot of um kind of echo chamber type stuff where you know people are starting to talk more to the people that are willing to listen to them and 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 ultimately i, I think that that's a big part of what happened so um I mean, I, this is all just kind of my personal take on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so these groups have, have more or less kind of um, drifted apart in, in that regard. Uh, there are a few people that still work somewhat at the intersection, but they're mainly within the U.S. Geological Survey. Mm -hmm. um, not so much in terms of running active research programs in at a, a university level level. Um, at the interface there. So this exchange all goes back to my original question about the kinds of programs you were looking at for the PhD. Yeah, so I, I mean, I was looking at, at, at this area and not really finding a whole lot. Um, and ultimately, just um, the one of the people that I'd, I'd been looking at to work with who the research I really kind of was inspired by at least what he had done in the past. Uh, this was at, um, at Reno, Nevada, University of Nevada, Reno, which had a, um, historically had a very strong program in, in kind of earthquake science and, and engineering, um, very integrated. Um, he was kind of on his way out the door <laughs> and effectively, you know, had said something like that um, back then to me, even though um, he, he basically had, I, I met with him and I talked with him and he basically just said, you know, I, I don't, I can't support a, a student right now. And, and, you know, he didn't have too many years left in his, um, in his appointment, basically. So he ultimately ended up forwarding me a um, an email that my eventual PhD advisor at USC had sent around to his department looking for students. And um, so 
my advisor was not an engineering seismologist at all. <laughs> he's a, he's very much a, a pure geophysicist focused on the earthquake science problem and um, relatively little on the, the the hazard modeling side of all that stuff. Um, Zach, what about at Caltech? Was Tom Heaton still taking students at that point, or did you think about working with Nadia Lapusta? Um, no, I mean, I, I just didn't, I didn't think that I could get into Caltech, quite honestly, at, at that point. <laughs> You'd wait to become a professor, of course. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, so, the, I mean, it just wasn't, uh, at that time, it just wasn't, a, I, I don't think, a, an option. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, so he had forwarded this email and copied this professor on it. And I started to talk to him and the guy was very motivated to look for students and that kind of thing. And, and who, who is this? Who's the, who was your advisor? Uh, Yehuda Ben Zion at USC, oh, yeah. who's now the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. Yep. So, um, so I thought about it and I mean, he was, he was very motivated to, to bring me there and, and, you know, made it all happen kind of right away. And, uh, and that's kind of, you know, the direction that it all went into. I have heard that he is a prolific collaborator and that his research agenda is, is very varied. What was he working on? What were some of the big projects when you arrived at USC? Yeah, um, well, when I got to USC, he had just gotten a, a quite a large NSF project funded, um, a multi-institutional project that was like a five-year NSF um, thing, all focused around understanding the, the San Jacinto Fault Zone, um, which is one of the major systems in Southern California which would include a large instrumentation component over the five-year period to monitor the fault zone um, better than at a resolution much higher than you could get with the, you know, the permanent instrumentation that was there. Um, kind of long-term modeling of the system, analysis of the data that was collected there, um, and so forth. It was also in terms of um, geodetic measurements of, of the, the fault zone as well to look for various signals that people had been proposing might be there um, and so forth. So it was a very broadly kind of integrated um, project uh, with about five different PIs on it. And, um, and I showed up at USC basically uh, around the day that it was funded and and you know i had a copy of the proposal in, in my hand <laughs> six months before i got there and, and you know looking at it and thinking you know this looks really quite exciting and um so that that ended up being a very large part of what i did, um was involved with during my phd now, you mentioned it was during the, the thesis stage that you really came to appreciate the, the computational value. I wonder if you could speak to that in a little more detail. Right. So a lot of this, um, when I got to USC, um, you know, I, I pretty much walked into Huda's office and told him that I was really interested in doing statistics on, on earthquakes. <laughs> um, and he said, okay, okay. Um, and during the master's time, I had spent a lot of the coursework I took relating to statistics and, and that kind of thing, because on the engineering seismology side, that that's a central part of how they model all of this stuff, the hazard analysis. They model the ground motions, they model the the magnitude scenarios of earthquakes, they model all this stuff, and it's heavily statistical and empirical. And so I took all of this statistics coursework and, and stuff and showed up there and thought, okay, this is now, you know, I've got this whole mindset, here's what I'm going to do. And 
meanwhile, they'd collect, they're starting to collect all this data. And um, I realized almost right away that it was next to impossible to be able to do any of the stuff that I wanted to do <laughs> with that data. Um, going from that raw data to basically a catalog of earthquakes, which is just line by line, you know, the coordinates that the earthquake occurred at the, for the, the hypocenter, the magnitude, the time that it happened at, basic information like this, which is what you would use as the foundation for kind of all of the, um, the stuff that you would do downstream. Um, it was nearly impossible to do that. Um, and so there were, you know, there were a, a few ways to do this kind of thing, but it, it was not very effective and it required quite large time investments to learn how to run all this software, tune it properly for the region that you're working on, the data set that you've collected learning how to recognize, you know, false detections of earthquakes and all sorts of problems that can arise from this whole thing. Um, and in the end, it still didn't even work out very well. So, um, so a large part of what I ultimately did during my PhD was relating to uh, the development of better techniques for this whole earthquake monitoring problem, detecting them, locating them, measuring the, the phase arrival times automatically, um, that kind of thing, which is fundamental to, to what a seismologist does, because in most cases you take all that information um, as the starting point for your analysis. Uh, and, you know, if there's a seismic network like Caltex that's already running and established, you can just download all their information, which has been manually reviewed by, by human experts. But if you put out a bunch of new sensors in the field like this, it's a total nightmare to try to be able to do all that from scratch for a totally new sensor configuration and that kind of thing. Um, so this was a very big motivator for me in terms of the research to kind of help me get towards where I wanted to go. What aspects of your thesis research, you know, had uh, an interest in, in applications in, you know, mitigation and preparation, early warning, things like that. And what aspects were, you know, purely basic science, just figuring out how these things work. Um, I think at that time, most of it was focused more on basic science. Mm -hmm. um, but there were obvious applications of, of a lot of what I was doing for that as well, which I was aware of just in terms of what I would personally choose to pursue at that time. It was, it was more focused on the basic science. Um, and yeah, I mean, the main connection to me that I thought was still rooted in something that was very um, applied, I guess you could say, was the fact that all this stuff was uh, translatable to the the real-time earthquake monitoring aspects, which um, it wasn't even just that, um, you know, researchers could, were, were essentially unable to do this with any degree of ease uh, on their own data, but that the techniques that were even being used for the seismic networks, which are, you know, the backbone of the, the earthquake monitoring program in the US and around the world, um, even though they had them working, they didn't work very well. 
right? Which is why we have these seismic analysts that spend all day long just cleaning up the mistakes that these things make. Um, and it became obvious, especially that even on the side of just not, not just in terms of um, fixing mistakes, but also the idea that there were so many more smaller earthquakes that were um, being missed by the, the existing algorithms uh, started to become very uh, obvious to me and, and the importance of that. Just being at USC and its connections with the network and SCEC, I'm curious just institutionally, administratively, how those things might have been of value for your research. Um, yeah, I, I think being at a an institution that has a heavy emphasis on earthquake science uh, was certainly a... a a very important part of my my time there. Um, there's really not a lot of those, and they're all concentrated on the West Coast. Even though, you know, there today there's really no reason for that to be the case. Um, you know, because most of the time we're not using our backyard as a as a natural laboratory for this stuff, and right. you can ship sensors around the world and whatever. Um, but really. Earthquake science is heavily concentrated on in the Western U.S. at a handful of institutions that are just kind of, you know, they, they've gone all in, in 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 that area, and they have a large number of people working on that topic, and so there's a, a handful of really big players in this space. So being there, and also the fact that Skek is headquartered there, was um, was definitely something that. Uh, left an impact on me, uh, being a part of SCEC every year at the annual meeting and so forth, which is in Palm Springs. Um, it, it definitely had a, a, a big part. Zach, as you mentioned earlier, this shift in the field where engineers were taking on more and more of this themselves, and even in generational terms, how the initial interest you had were really led by an older generation. I wonder how that played out, how that might have affected how your your thesis progressed. Um, well, I mean, for me, I, I kind of started to recognize this niche area that, um, that it just didn't really seem like a lot of the community had picked up on it. Um, but it, if you talk to anybody and you, you know, you ask them about these NSF projects that they've, you know, got funded, they've got a three year project. The first year is all about deployment of the instrumentation. The second year or more is at least on paper, it's building the, the earthquake catalog. And then the final year of this whole thing is now you can do the, the science with all this that you wanted to do, which often doesn't even get to that point or it's very thin before you're already writing your next proposal and, and you know, thinking beyond this at that point. Um, it was something that seemed, it seemed to be that, you know, pretty much everybody in the field agreed was a, a big problem, but very few people were really um, devoting, you know, significant attention to at a at a larger um, at a larger scale. Um, there weren't community like major community efforts to to try to solve these problems. Um, And I kind of just started to try to do all of this stuff by myself. Were you thinking about AI and machine learning as a graduate student at all? Yeah. Um, I first was introduced to this topic uh, 
what year was that? That was probably around 2013, 2014, um, by a friend of mine who had taken a, a class over at UCLA on this as a grad student there, um, not in our field, he was in, in neuroscience, but uh, it, there was, at that point, there was already starting to be a lot of buzz about this topic. Um, you know, the, the words machine learning went from being totally unheard of prior to 2012 to just exploding in usage after that. So, and, and 20, December 2012 was the year of, or not the year, it was the, the moment basically of the, the big revolution in, in modern deep learning. That's when everything kind of just exploded at a single talk and, um, and so within a very short amount of time, you know, the, the interest in offering courses exploded, you know, you went from having 500 people at the annual meeting, listening to, to these talks to 10, 15,000 people within a few years and, and so forth. So, um, it was already starting to make its way around by word of mouth. Um, and I bought a textbook, started to read it. Um, unfortunately for me at, at that time, the textbook itself was, uh, a bit too out of date and it didn't cover any of the, the advances that had happened in 2012, which were, which were extraordinary, made it revolutionary in this field. Um, and so it wasn't entirely obvious to me how to use that stuff at that point with, for, for good reason, because it was just not exposed in, in this, um, this book at that time. Uh, and so, you know, this was a book from like the mid two thousands and I figured, okay, well, you know, how, how old could it really be? But it was, it was, it turned out to be quite old, but, um, so I read the whole thing and kind of just put it in the back of my mind for when it might be useful down the road. Uh, I, I, I tried a little bit of what, um, what I learned about in just kind of toy research settings, but uh, it didn't quite have the, the, success that I really wanted it to. Um, so it wasn't really until I was at Caltech uh, that I started to make the connection between all of this stuff. Um, and were you following more generally the embrace of, 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 of you know, really high power computing for geophysics that was well underway at this point? that sort of broader trends in the field? To some degree, yeah. Um, I, I mean, the most noticeable of those, I think, was the the usage of GPU devices for computations, which started to really pick up um, within the last 10 years. Uh, and geophysics, was, at least especially at Caltech, was kind of at the forefront of this. Um, we, the Seismolab had a, a cluster in the basement that had a large number of GPUs on it. And, um, and that machine at the time was viewed by, you know, other evaluators, outside evaluators as kind of being crazy. Cause you know, you're putting all this money in these devices that nobody's ever heard of and betting that they're going to be useful and all this stuff. And, um, and so when I got to Caltech, that machine was there, it was already even kind of old at that point, but, um, it allowed me to basically do the, the first really big project that I pursued when I, um, when I got here. So I, I came to Caltech as a postdoc, uh, working under um, 
Ail Hoxon, if you've already spoken with him. Yeah. Um, and that was in 2016. And he uh, brought me there on an NSF project, which basically proposed to, or at least the Caltech contribution was to build a new, the kind of the first new catalog of earthquakes using modern techniques um, by going back and reprocessing the entire waveform archive that we had um, accumulated over basically since 2008. Um, and the technique that I was, that was proposed being used was something called template matching, which is basically using the records of, pre of previously detected earthquakes as templates to scan the data and search for similar signals essentially. And so it's kind of like a guided search in some sense, which had been shown to be very effective uh, in a number of very small scale studies over the previous, you know, decade, basically since probably 2006 or so. Um, but it was very computationally demanding to do this. And so I was going to basically scale up this technique to the largest data set that anybody had attempted on by orders of, of magnitude and, um, and build this whole thing. And so, um, so that was a multi-year project, you know, it was a two plus year thing that I wrote all the code from scratch and, and immediately was made aware of, you know, the potential for using these GPU devices to do this. And I pretty much took over the, the, you know, computing clusters on campus during that time and, and, uh, did this really massive, uh, search for all these events. And that led to this, um, this science paper that was published in 2019, uh, where we built, we, we, we um, documented this new catalog and all the stuff that you could see in it that you couldn't before, um, what was revealed in the process, you know, you, you detect like 10 times more events essentially than we had in the previous catalog, something like 2 million of those. Um, and it was a, um, I think it was kind of a, it came at a very pivotal moment in, in the field and it, it started to make people recognize mm -hmm. all of what they were um, missing in the data that they had. Um, Zach, to go back to this idea that when you were looking at PhD programs, Caltech did not seem to be in the cards for you. And then to fast forward to the postdoc, that really does beg the question, you know, from you, what was the significance of your thesis research that, that, that shifted that, that made a place like Caltech available to you for research? Um, well, uh, I mean, I was definitely in, in a very good position upon um, finishing my PhD, I had a number of postdoc offers in hand without applying for anything or even um, talking to people. I think I had four offers. Um, and, but it was really, I mean, I, at that point I had already, it, it, there was no question in my mind that that was coming here. Um, this was kind of the center of, of everything earthquake science. And, you know, you see it in a million different forms from, you know, just looking at all the web pages of, of faculty around the country and the fact that they, you know, it's an over a very disproportionate number of them have come out of our program here. Um, there's just a, a outright dominance in this space at meetings and so forth, you walk around and you're just swamped with 
posters from from the Seismolab and all of this stuff. Um, so there was really no question to me that um, that I was going to be coming here. Um, but Al Hoxton was very uh, he was very focused on on getting me here and and kind of jumped at the chance early on and um, and uh, and I definitely decided to to accept that. And of all people, why Ale? What was what was he working on that might have made this a natural fit for you? Um. Well, he. I mean, ultimately, he was willing to put up the money for it, oh. <laughs> um, which is was a big. Um, that's a big aspect about the whole thing. Um, I had applied for the various postdoc fellowships that, that we offered and was not given anything. Um, which is still, I think, uh, an interesting uh, topic for some of my colleagues. Um, you know, kind of in hindsight of, of how did that happen kind of thing. Um, And for whatever reason, uh, he was the one that that was expressing the the strongest interest rather than any one of them. Uh, you know, I, I had talked to various people, but it was never, uh, you know, a clear. Um, fit or even just, uh, you know, there, it wasn't any strong initiative to make something happen, basically. Um, so, yeah, I, that's, that's how I, I came to Caltech. What were some of the key challenges in setting up this ambitious program with Ale once, once you got to Caltech? Uh, well, there's a million key challenges. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, I, I had already worked extensively with, with data of that scale and, and during the PhD, um, building catalogs and that kind of thing before that. So I, you know, I'd already done some of the kind of the largest automated runs, you know, worldwide at that point. But then this whole thing was at a different scale, even beyond that. But so, you know, scoping out kind of the whole extent of the project, trying to plan for all the, the potential problems. Um, it, it, it just, one of the big ones was um, just trying to keep track of all of the the processing and making sure that there weren't pieces missing and so forth, because everything is done in parallel, but at a totally independent level. And so, you know, you process one chunk of data, small chunk that totally independent of all the others. And, and so if something breaks somewhere, you've got to go back and, and find out what happened there and fix it, even though the rest of them are all running, right? It's not, um, just the kind of thing where, you know, the whole thing fa falls apart if, and so we don't want big gaps in the data, basically, because, you know, small pieces here and there were, um, had issues, um, writing the code to be efficiently able to, to do what I wanted to do and, and trying to actually estimate how much time it was going to take to do this. And, um, rewriting it over and over again until I got it into a form that I thought I was going to be able to work with and, and actually make it happen. And, um, you know, just, it, it was an, an absolutely massive data set to, to process. Um, and how much of the challenge was about 
the computers and how much of it was about the people, just in terms of resources? Uh, the computers were somewhat, but not, I wouldn't say it's most of it. Um, you know, at one point I pretty much took an entire month using all of the, the, um, the GPUs on the Caltech central, uh, machine. Um, so we had the capabilities to do it. I mean, it's just, it's not, you know, you push a button and it's done an hour later, right? It was um, running one year at a time and coming back, you know, days later and verifying that everything looked okay or fixing things that hadn't worked and, and then running the next year and repeating this and, and so forth. Um, recognizing that there was various problems that showed up in the results at, at certain stages and having to go back and try to troubleshoot what those were in the middle of this huge run. And, um, you know, cause it's not like you can just easily, um, backtrack what had happened when it's something at that scale. So learning how to diagnose problems in, in that situation was, was quite challenging. Um, but yeah, the resources were just not really there and I had to pretty much do everything uh, myself. <laughs> um, I got some really good support from NVIDIA at the time mm -hmm. who um, had, I, I can't even remember how they got involved, but one of their engineers, um, I guess had heard about it or something and um, volunteered some of their time to actually look at a very fundamental part of my code and actually make some really important optimization suggestions in there that which sped it up quite a bit. Um, so something that's just being looped over, you know, many, many, many times at, at the lowest level of the code. So, yeah, I had some external support for this, but not a whole lot. <laughs> uh, but Zach, as you I, mentioned, as you explained, you know, the, the, the name of the game here is in recognizing all of the signals in the noise, that there's so much valuable data there. Do you have a, a specific memory, even a eureka moment of when that was born out that you actually started to see this stuff and that all the effort was paying off? Um, I mean, maybe the closest thing to that was when was about, uh, Well, it was in, I guess it was July 2016. It was not too long after I first got here and we had a magnitude 5.2 uh, in the San Jacinto. And I had already been working on, had a, a, like a very initial version of the code written at that point to do this. Um, so I, process this small sequence basically with this code and, and could see the, um, everything that came out of it. And, uh, that by itself turned into a fairly important paper. Um, and so I was pretty convinced at, at that point that it was going to be a worthwhile effort. Zach, more broadly at Caltech, as you admired from afar, just, you know, all of the authors, the papers, the people who had come through the Seismolab, what were your impressions when you got there about the research culture, you know, beyond working with Ale, about 
coffee break and the collaborative nature of postdocs and graduate students and faculty. What struck you about the Seismo Lab in that regard? Um, that even though kind of the size of it was was really you know it's it's quite large. We have a pretty big operation and, and program at Caltech in this area, right? We have a lot of, we, I mean, when I got there, we had almost 20 postdocs in seismology. we had maxed out the space on the second floor. There's, you know, 30 graduate students in this area. It's a huge program. And yet it's still um, felt kind of very close in that sense. Um, so, I mean, everybody kind of just knows everybody very well and um, knows what they're working on. They're, they're um, you know, this program is much, much larger than what, what USC had. Um, and, but it still felt like a very kind of tight knit community uh, that just valued lots of discussion and and science and, and everything else. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that stood out for me, but was, and probably because I spent a lot of time at institutions were not necessarily the, the creme de la creme, was that everybody that was there really they really wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't need to kind of, you know, work really hard to convince someone why they should care about being there and, and what that meant in terms of their career down the road or anything. It was just, you were surrounded by a bunch of people that just really wanted to, yeah. to learn about stuff and, um, rather than just, you know, going through the motions of, of doing something because that's what they'd always been doing or whatever. Um, I saw a lot of that before, but I see very little of that kind of thing here. In talking about your work and conveying the, really the excitement about all of the important data that could be gleaned in the in the way that you were doing this, how, how what was the process of, of people who might have been orthogonal to this field in terms of them understanding its, its its importance and its relevance for the things that they were working on? Did this catch on immediately? Was it sort of a, a an elongated process? Uh, no, it didn't catch on immediately. I mean, I think, especially once I started to work on the um, on the machine learning side of all this, which was you know mid. 2017 um, and we were basically you know the the first group in, in the world to start doing this at that time um, people didn't really quite know what to make out of all of this stuff um, the level of interest was increasing very quickly so we had basically two initial papers on the, the deep learning seismology stuff by the end of 2017. Um, and I gave my first uh, public presentation on this topic to, uh, this was at AGU in, in December of 2017. And you could see, I mean, I, I knew that the value of all this, it was, you know, within our group at Caltech that was working on it, it was very obvious to me and to the rest of us that, that this was um, going to be a major change in, in the way that the field did stuff. Um, but, you know, we hadn't discussed this really with anybody 
outside at that point. And so um, I remember just getting up on that stage and in, in at AGU and the room was was it was packed and I, I just people were just walking in and they were standing outside even in the hallway trying to still listen. And I remember just looking around the room and seeing everybody's going like while I'm talking and I thought, you know, this is, there's something happening here. Yeah. Um, you know, I could see all the heads just like nodding in agreement with everything I was saying. And, you know, there was lots of claims that I was making about, you know, the way that things have been done before and the challenges with all that and what, you know, this was going to do differently. And, um, so it was already, there was already, you know, a lot of whispers and stuff about all of this and, and, you know, this is before the funding agencies start telling you that they want people working on these types of things. And, you know, it, it hasn't followed that whole process yet. Right. This was still very early on in this whole, whole trajectory. So, you know, it's, it's five years now since then. Um, and at the same time, you know, over the next few years, it was just, we were attacking one problem after another with all of this and, and solving big things and saw, you know, all sorts of, um, doors opening and, but the community itself, even though it was being becoming very interested in all of this, I think that not just in seismology, but beyond seismology kind of in geoscience and, and geophysics was looking at a lot of this and, and trying to make sense out of everything about what, what it was really going to lead to scientifically. And, um, and, you know, again, it was kind of, um, you know, I, I remember applying for faculty jobs at in the middle of all this stuff and, and when it's, you know, just exploding and people kind of just not sure what to do with it. Zach, I know the time scale we're talking about here is really only five years, but it's really incredible progress in machine learning and AI in these short past few years. What was most relevant for you in terms of the advances? What, in what ways did that supercharge what you had already undertaken? It so the connections came back to everything I did when I was not everything, but what I had learned about machine learning when I was in grad school. When I realized that, when when I started to basically um, come across, I, I don't remember exactly the way that it happened, but I, I remember coming across kind of the modern deep learning, which had not made it into that textbook at that point, but it was a, a kind of a sea change in this stuff. Um, or it made it, it might've been in the book, but it was like this much space devoted to it. And that's not the kind of thing that, you know, whereas today they have an, you know, entire fields based on all of this. That's the kind of thing you might just, you know, skip past and not even know that it was, a big deal. Um, but I, I recognize that, that basically, you know, there's all these people working in, in computer vision, which is essentially a, now a, a subfield of AI that's focused on um, learning from learning structure from uh, images, essentially, and being able to do that automatically. So whether that means um, recognizing objects within images or um, localizing them within the image, potentially drawing a bounding box around the object, um, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so the connection for me was when I recognized that um, that this type of technology was able to was like the state of the art and able to solve that type of problem um extremely well and specifically it was kind of the bounding box problem because that was um mathematically it's it's identical to the types of w one of the major types of problems that we have on on detecting the earthquake stuff 
And so recognizing that was, it was just immediate. And, um, and within a short amount of time, I had it, the, I, I tested the stuff out and it, and it worked so well that I couldn't even really believe the, the results initially and, and that kind of thing. And I had to spend even some amount of time convincing myself that it was, um, that it was real. But, um, and then beyond that, once that was working, it was kind of just recognizing that this was an entire paradigm. It wasn't just about solving one specific problem, but a, a, a way of generically solving problems. Um, that the whole, there was going to be a paradigm shift in the way that you, um, you know, you, you approach all sorts of task automation and, and all sorts of things. Uh, I, you know, just immediately you can see the potential for all of the different applications to the whole field where it was going to go and, and all that stuff. And so we had a, you know, a huge list of things that we just started checking off one after the next yeah. because we could realize that, um, you know, this is how you would now solve that problem, which nobody really knew how to do before. Zach, in thinking about all of these advances in AI and machine learning, did you ever consider this as a two-way street? In other words, the kinds of things you were developing were good for AI itself, or did you see yourself primarily as a consumer of these technologies? Yeah, no, initially it was just kind of, you know, trying to make sure that I'd learned enough not to make myself look kind of stupid within that community and that I was following good practices and things like that. Um, and so, you know, the first pay, I mean, I was entirely self-taught on this stuff. You know, I never took a course in any of it. Um, it and at that point, there wasn't really even textbooks available on it either. And so it was a lot of scouring the web for blog posts written by researchers and other things and trying to to figure out the math behind this stuff and and reading some research articles um and yeah just trying to make myself feel like i was actually learning the 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 proper ways of of doing all of this stuff Zach, I'm always a lot, there's a lot of those i'm always fascinated by you know when there's major um uh discovery there's a, a real moment of as you call it a paradigm shift were you aware of of any you know what we call multiple independent scientific discovery was anybody else beyond caltech in the field even beyond this country sort of on this same track that you were at the same time that you might not have even known about at first yeah there was um there was basically there were two other groups um so I, I'm, I mean, I think timing wise, there was really one other group that was at Harvard that had been thinking about this. Um, they submitted a, an, their first paper on this uh, about a month or so before I submitted mine. Um, and I didn't know that they had submitted that uh, until I saw, you know, a presentation on it at AGU that year. Um, so it wasn't, I mean, I wasn't even clear what, whether they had done something, how similar it was. Um, but, um, and then there was a group at Stanford that emerged very shortly after that, um, that ultimately became kind of my main competitor in this space over a period of several years. Um, what's been healthy about that, that competition? Uh, it, I mean, it, everything, it's been a good group. It, they're a very good group and they're, um, they're good people, um, super smart people and, and, and experts in this stuff as well. So they've, um, it just, you know, we kept very close eyes on what each other was doing and, and trying to um, you know, work towards a common advance in, in this area. Um, and of course, you know, it just opened the floodgates with, after that. And there's now been, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers published on the same topic as what we did initially with, with this since then. Um, 
Yeah. So that was, so when I started all of this, I mean, my, my math background was not the strongest. And I mean, I had a lot of familiarity with all this stuff, but not at a, a very, um, nothing like it is today. And I mean, so to get back to your question, I mean, you know, I initially moved into this and then I got effectively um, connected with Yi Song Yu at, at, across campus in, in CMS. Mm -hmm. um, and I got him to basically agree to work on a project. And, um, and so I, I started to actually get real experience working with an expert in this space and, yeah. and that kind of thing. And um, the more that I learned, the more I kind of moved very strongly into that into that direction. And, and with that came having to really um, strengthen my mathematical background in all of this. Um, and it's now kind of gone, you know, so we, we started to talk to them initially about just, you know, trying to solve our problems with existing technology. But eventually it started to get to the point where, you know, some of the stuff that we want to do, they don't know how to solve it. <laughs> and, or at least doesn't, they don't have straightforward um, solutions right away. And so it's kind of almost come full circle in some sense over the last year or two, because we've, um, you know, we've published a few papers now in machine learning research journals uh, on kind of new ML stuff that was, that came out of what we have been doing on the seismology side, right? It's, it's, we developed it specifically with seismological applications in mind, but realized that it was, you know, not, had not been done before, even within the, 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 the ML community itself. And so I've been working very closely with a lot of the machine learning researchers, some that are still here, some that are formerly here. Um, and that's a very active part of what, what we're doing now. So we not only just apply the technology, but we're also um, very actively involved in developing the technology that we use when, when it becomes important. Zach, moving to 2019, what was the process for you joining the faculty? Did they open up a position for you? Did you apply to something that was open? How did that work? Yeah. Um, so there was a there was an open position that um, had been posted, and um, yeah, and I applied for it. Um, that was probably when was that? I think that was in around March of 2018, something like that. It was in the spring of 2018. And um, so I applied for it. You know, this is right in the middle of all of this stuff when it's happening. And um, it was just, you know, I wasn't sure exactly what, you know, I, back then at least there was a lot more of me, you know, with the, doing the big sell on everything than, um, than I need to do today, right? Yeah. Today, it's, I do. I know what already what it, what it's accomplished and that kind of thing. And, um, Did transitioning from postdoc to faculty change your research at all, or was it kind of seamless? Um, it's it has changed it. In what uh, ways? Uh, it's forced me to to broaden a lot of what I do. In, in terms um, of teaching, in terms of mentoring graduate students, that kind of thing? No, in terms of my research program itself. Uh-huh. 
Um, I mean, I, force is probably not even the right word, but it, that's it's kind of a natural um, outcome, at least for me. In a good way that it's broadened you out. Yeah, yeah, because you know you have this new student that comes in and you don't want to put them working on something that's almost the same as what somebody else is already doing, right? Right. The student wants to kind of have their own space and research identity and all, and, and be the local expert on this or that or whatever. And, and so, you know, even when someone comes and says, oh, I want to work on that too. And it's kind of like, well, you know, let's find you something else to do instead. Right. Um, so I've definitely broadened uh, a lot of what I, what I do both on, um, on the scientific side. So we've expanded in the last, you know, I guess the last two years um, into volcano seismology, um, which I never did before. Um, that's because one of my students had arrived and basically said he wanted to do, apply all this technology that we developed to that kind of setting. Um, and so we've done a pretty heavy dive into some of that now and it's having you know similar successes within that space as well um and so um because we were you know well positioned to take advantage of of that kind of thing there too um i've broadened um like i said from my I, I would say that the balance of what I do is I've tried to keep it the same. So, you know, my, my research program is, is about half on the um, kind of the, the methods and mathematical side of, of this, which is you know, the machine learning and, and statistics and, and that kind of stuff. So all about techniques and, and that, we develop to do all these different things better. And the other half is applying this stuff for, to solve various scientific problems. And I've tried very hard to kind of keep, maintain that balance. Um, but definitely within the, the, each side of this, I've expanded as well. Right. So like I said before, my, my math background is, is, and, computer science background has expanded substantially to the point where, you know, I can read current research papers in this area and listen to, you know, I can attend the conferences. I've, I've done it a number of times before. I work very closely with people who are, you know, leaders in this space and, and feel very comfortable talking with them today and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I understand all their terminology. I understand I have the, the right math background to follow it along. And we're doing research even at that end of it as well. So um, so that whole thing is broadened, but then also scientifically we've expanded as well into the the, the range of, of topics that, that we look at and, and, and that kind of thing. Zach, being a new faculty member and then not too long after COVID hits, I wonder on the negative side, what might have been some of the real difficulties in the, you know, just the, the isolation? And on the positive mm. side, because so much of what you can do remotely, was it an opportunity to really do a deep dive and focus and not get in, pulled into all of the other things that happened in uh, pre-pandemic days? Yeah, I mean... So I had been at, already at Caltech for uh, almost four years at that point. Um, so the good thing was that I was very familiar with the Institute and the way that it used to be and, and everything else. And, um, and I had been a faculty member for about eight months at that point. Um, so that was helpful just to even have a, a very basic sense of a, of a reference point, you know, for what things should be like. Right. <laughs> as opposed to some of my colleagues that started right in the middle of it. And that was a totally different 
thing because they got there and just didn't know what to expect and thought that that was just the way things were you know you don't know what's recent versus what's sure not it's it's a mess um i mean personally i don't think that it, it really caused any major problems other than just you know it was certainly not um the greatest time <laughs> and yeah a lot of isolation obviously um i was still in my office much of that time working um but i was the only one in the building basically um and yeah having to uh, kind of be the the support person for a number of um people that are all you know living far away from their family a lot of them are foreign nationals they were you know 2020 in this country was a pretty intense time period to be a foreign national um and you know you can't leave the country either and there's all sorts of stuff happening you know that it was it was very hard for a lot of people and so having to um be you know looking after everybody and, and making sure that people aren't falling through the cracks and and that kind of thing was was certainly challenging um so yeah to go back to this idea that you know in the initial part of this journey for you you were really proclaiming the value of this approach and now hundreds of papers are coming out as a result just at a high level what's been possible now that wasn't five years ago um what's possible now at least for us not necessarily i mean i'm still talking to people all the time that still can't figure this out but that's a different story right um we can pretty much acquire an arbitrary data set um from almost anywhere in the world and, and, well, and what does arbitrary mean here yeah so the 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 configuration of the seismic sensors how they're positioned and that kind of thing the number of them um doesn't matter whether they're you know in holes in the ground or they're on the surface where it's very noisy or whatever it is it's just kind of any seismic data set that could be turned on today mm -hmm. you flip a switch and the data starts flowing and and you've never seen anything in it before you don't know whether there's any earthquakes at all in it um it could be a totally new region of the world that's never been studied before and we can basically flip another switch and build a, a big catalog of, of earthquakes with very high quality that can reveal so much more information about the earth uh, in it than it ever could before um, and so that's that's one of the main things it's not it's not the only thing but it's it's certainly a very central part of, of a lot of what we do why the move into volcanology what prompted that well because like i said the the main thing was because i had a student that was very interested in that and said you know saw all the cool stuff we're doing in earthquake seismology and said you know there's immediate applications of all this stuff to that setting as well because volcanoes produce tons of micro earthquake activity um around them and and so you can use all this same stuff to study those systems and better understand them um so it was a very natural and obvious extension of of these techniques we developed with almost no extra effort um it just happens to be that you know a lot of the volcanic systems naturally produce lots of earthquake activity are there other students who have pulled you into different fields similarly or are you looking forward to the next student who will help you do that 
that's probably the biggest uh, change in my research program uh, since I started my faculty appointment, um, which was, you know, it, it was also a lot of, it was a big time investment as well, at least on the scientific side. I mean, you know, I, I knew nothing about volcanoes before that student arrived and had to do a massive review of the literature to get to the point where I felt comfortable enough working in, in the space uh, as a, you know, at the forefront of it and that kind of thing. Um, so I invested a huge amount of time reading books and papers and, you know, it was probably a, a year and a half effort uh, with a substantial time commitment uh, associated to that alone to, to get there. And do you think this will remain in your research agenda beyond your affiliation oh, with yeah, the students? At this point, absolutely. What's the frontier for you in volcanology? What does that look like? Um, well, uh, right now we're doing a lot of really ex stuff, exciting stuff in Hawaii, and um, which is the best understood volcanic system on Earth. But we're finding there's all sorts of really fundamental things there that have been um, missed or not, not, not for a lack of trying, but because they didn't have uh, the resolution to see things that we can see. So, um, so we're very uh, focused on imaging the, the subsurface structure of the volcanic system and, and looking at the kind of the pathways for magma transport from the upper mantle to the individual volcanoes that, and where the magma reservoirs are that store that. Um, so it's kind of like, how does that even get there in the first place? Um, which historically has been very, very poorly understood uh, for something that's so critical to these systems, you know, how it moves from deep to, to shallow. Um, and we're starting to be able to see very clear uh, evidence for what these pathways look like, the geometrical aspects about them and, and you know, where they're positioned and, and that kind of thing at a level of detail that's unprecedented. So, um, so yeah, I mean, pretty much anything that has seismicity associated with it uh, is an opportunity for applying these types of methods. And this could, this could bring you not just in Hawaii, but anywhere else on the globe. Yeah. Well, Zach, now that we've worked right up to the present for the last part of our talk, if I could ask a few retrospective questions about what you've accomplished so far, then we'll end looking to the future. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's such a short time scale in terms of this field or the subdiscipline that you've helped found. At this point, would you say that this is a mature discipline in terms of its acceptance, in terms of it, its its utilization? What are the, the benchmarks that you would use to answer that question? Yeah, I think that it's, at this point, it's pretty much undisputedly the state of the art for, for doing all this stuff today. Um, and the field has come a lot of, a long way in that time as well, in that um, they've established very rigorous benchmarks during the process of all of this uh, for evaluating the performance of, of these things, which really did not exist in a rigorous way before that. It was kind of every researcher off on their own, testing things on the data so that they choose without really any clear commonality between them, which was also the case in machine learning before 10 years ago as well. Um, and so the community-wide benchmarks and so forth has, has also helped to move this uh, and provide you know, validity to the, the, the techniques as well. Um, so it's very clear, I mean, um, yeah, like I said, I mean, there's probably been between 500 to 1,000 papers on machine learning and seismology that have been published in the last four years. Um, and, you know, I talk to people everywhere I go that 
are using these these things now on this data set or that data set and i see the results of the research coming out with it and that kind of thing so i know exactly how well it, it works i mean i knew that by myself but i mean i can see the that other people are, are, are doing things as well. So it's not just uh, me, you know, isolated looking at things. Um, and I mean, there's, you know, we've somewhat moved on to other problems in this. I mean, I've, I've kind of recognized that a lot of it was approaching kind of a saturation point, um, you know, already three plus years ago. And and started working on other types of problems with the machine learning that are not just this this exact area. So, um, and you know, it's having impact in, in those spaces as well. So it's not just specifically on the, the earthquake detection side, but um, but being able to talk with and work with the the computer scientists at a at a you know pretty um, demanding level has been very helpful for me in, in all these aspects. Um, you know, one of the big frontiers that we're working on right now is on accelerating simulations with machine learning. So it's not even data driven at all, but it's on trying to run, you know, like big earthquake rupture simulations at, you know, at supercomputing scale, but hopefully on your laptop instead. Um, and do this efficiently and that kind of thing, which has been a big challenge. And so we've been working a lot with folks like Anima and Kumar and some of her former students and postdocs and um, Kate Bauman, other people on campus that, uh, and uh, to, to do this problem. And, and that's keeping our focus for some time, it will for some time now, I think. Zach, from the initial um, competition with Stanford, how has the field grown? Where are there other research centers where this is their central research focus? The machine learning specifically? Yeah. Um, or is it still early on in that regard? It's still Caltech and Stanford. It's definitely... Um, a, that's a big... Yeah, and we were kind of still, I think, the two big players in this space. And in fact, most of the, the competition that I had up there was really from one um, graduate student who is now a postdoc here. Uh, <laughs> That's <so> awesome. <laughs> I kind of kneecapped them a little bit by taking him away. <laughs> Not that he would have stayed there anyway, but, um, but we're certainly benefiting from having him down here. Um, I mean, there's a handful of groups around Europe that are um, are pretty rapidly moving into this space and and people are finding their you know there there was there was the whole community was forced to have to learn what machine learning was and and all that kind of thing um, in whatever way that they did so that they could talk to experts on that side and and um, so we're definitely seeing that. Uh... And for you looking to the future, what areas might you move into that you haven't yet? For example, taking machine learning seismology to other planets. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly that's a, that's a possibility. Um, I haven't worked on the Mars stuff just because for me, that's pretty, it's still pretty small data. So um, it's one, one seismometer, right? Sensor, yeah. And then, so it's just not, it, it, intellectually, it's not very appealing to me um, because it, it just does not, it, it feels very limiting compared to what I'm used to, to working with. And for many people, they, they enjoy that aspect of feeling very, you know, like they're in a straight jacket and, you know, you can only focus on the one thing in front of you. But for me, it's, you know, working with routinely with the largest networks on earth, it's um, more than enough to do. Yeah, but um, but certainly, I mean, there's talks about putting networks back on the moon. That could be interesting. Um, we're doing stuff now with the distributed acoustic sensing data that Zongwen is collecting, which is very, very large scale. Um, so we're 
working on now on trying to translate some of our techniques and to that context. And that's already starting to look very successful. Um, so that's quite exciting and it's, but it's got enough of a twist to it from the conventional stuff that we do that it, it makes it not just a straightforward, um, uh, application of what we've already done, which is nice. It's also more fun that way. Um, I'm doing, uh, so I mentioned before, I've kind of moved back a bit towards the engineering seismology side of this. So I'm working with Dominique Yasumaki in, um, uh, in civil engineering to, um, basically work on machine learning models that generate, um, stochastic realizations of ground motions that can be used by engineers to, um, to run building structural simulations and things like that. So, but it's all learned learning based. So you give it a big data set of, of earthquake, um, ground motion time histories of the shaking. You know, we take, we have a data set of like 500,000 records from Japan with large shaking records and, and it can basically learn from that and then generate new shaking records that are totally synthetic, but fully consistent with the, um, the real records conditional on things like the earthquake magnitude and the distance that it's from your site and how soft the soil is and, and things like this. Um, and I think that, and that's, we've been working on this now for several years and it's really going to be, I think a big deal in that space as well. Um, once we can fully convince the engineers to that this is real. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different directions from here. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a very exciting time to, to be in this, in this business. Finally, Zach, last question, looking to the future. What is the pace of advance in AI and machine learning? Is there like a, like a Moore's law or some kind of schedule of advancement that you yeah, can basically was, it, see and, and that, and that would help you plan out what you're capable of doing in lockstep with those advances? I don't know exactly what it is right now, but at least up until a couple of years ago, it was outpacing Moore's law. Yeah. So, um, the number of papers was just, you know, per year, it's just extraordinary. And it's impossible to keep up with all the literature. Um, even for the people in the field, it's impossible. So, um, so now at least, you know, for my research, we've, we're, we're like I said, we, we've, started to recognize a big frontier as um, on accelerating the simulations, which is very important for a lot of different purposes from imaging the earth to simulating ground motion scenarios to all sorts of things. And, um, and it's also another major roadblock uh, in terms of um, doing the, the science that we want to do. So doing this stuff faster um, is very important. And there's a whole framework that was developed at Caltech uh, a few years ago that we got in on very early and then I was made aware of it even before it was ever published. Um, and it's, it's extremely promising. And so we're kind of focusing more on kind of stuff all related to this one area, uh, I would say. And that means that I'm working a lot with some of the same experts who are already very familiar with what's the, the new developments in this specific space on solving partial differential equations with machine learning. Um, and so I'm constantly being kept kind of in the loop on what the forefront is and, and that kind of thing. So I don't have to constantly focus on, you know, searching the literature myself as much as I, you know, let them do that and, and report back to me on what, um, are the new developments that we should be aware of and that kind of thing. It's taking on a life of its own beyond even what you might've envisioned. Mm -hmm. It is. And like I said, we're also, you know, it's feeding back in because we're also developing the, the, the technology on the, the computer science side as well. So, um, so we're, we're, you know, we're 
being aware of what they're doing, but also contributing to the the advancing of this as well. So it's pretty fascinating. Zach, this has been a great couple of conversations. I'm so glad we were able to do this and capture your, your contributions to the Seismo Lab. Thank you so much. Thank you.